you are. This is our 11th session. It might be our last. We hope that it will be, unless it's inadequate. <clears throat> We've kind of begun to feel like it might wind down at this point. We're glad to see you, particularly if you're on our Father's side and you're beginning to recognize that the information about His Kingdom that is being shared with you is, is true, that you can see that it is true. If that's happening, then we're happy for what you're beginning to feel because we can know that at that point that you're recognizing that you are very possibly a son of His. I can't even imagine that you would begin to recognize it if that possibility is not there for you. So, <clears throat> we earlier, uh, as we came into this, in, in preparation for this session, I told the crew here that uh, uh, during the morning hours and uh, as I was getting my bath that I received information that I would consider to be our punchline of this whole series, or the finale of this series. And <clears throat> so I'm excited about giving to you, it to you, but I'm also not going to give it to us right now because I'm going to use it as something to help us move quickly with our little questions as we proceed. I'm happy to uh, introduce to you today the teleprompters that are going to help us in this. And Star on my left is going to assist with program. I mean, with questions and as a teleprompter, as is Destin on my right. And we welcome this, welcome them to this project. Uh, let's just get right on and see how quickly we can move. So, Star, why don't you tell me what's, fir what's first on our list of questions? Is there a detox time that affects the clarity of head? A detox time for clarity of head? <clears throat> there certainly is. And uh, let's try to explain that to you. In the same way that if you've been on a drunk and you're really intoxicated, you really don't have clarity of head. You don't know what you're doing. You can't really think very straight until that begins to wane from your system till it starts to get out of your chemistry. And that's true whether it be drugs or alcohol or whatever affects your system. So strongly, we've discussed that all of the human behavior, all the little things that humans do that are not done in our Heavenly Father's kingdom are in a sense drugs, they affect our chemistry, they affect our thinking, they affect the clarity of our head. The one that seems to be the worst drug of sensuality or sexuality, that even though we are, that humans are unaware of it putting them in a drunken condition and are certainly unaware that there is a, is a detox period or a withdrawal period, our experience is that we can very clearly see, and because we have all experienced what an effect it has on interfering with our detox or our clarity of head. Uh, <clears throat> when we as a classroom, or when T and I took these students into the woods, as we've mentioned before, and we began to get endeavor uh, in earnest in our uh, overcoming, we explained that this behavior has to stop. Now, I'm going to move to another topic and come right back to this detox. And that topic is this morning in working with some of the members of the class that wanted to assist in the preparation of the jacket material for this series. We, we just were overcome with how lucky we were in this big, beautiful, picture of our Father's kingdom, the, the picture that has been given to us, the information that piece by piece forms a puzzle and a giant picture that tells us so much about our Father's kingdom, so much about the human kingdom and even other aspects of his creation. And But most of all, it tells us that for one reason only, and it's for the purpose of assisting 
potential graduates from the human kingdom into our Father's kingdom, it, it explains how that is done and gives the specific step-by-step -step instructions and disciplines that must be employed to make that transition. And we've noticed how as we take instruction and how we apply instructions and procedures that so frequently we say, well, that makes a lot of sense because we've recognized that all of this picture makes a lot of sense. But it doesn't, now let's go back to detox. It doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense if we aren't really sober. And if we can't be sober until we have had some time behind us away from those things that change our consciousness and keep our consciousness on them, let's talk a moment about how, how sensuality and sexuality is such a drug. You know, an alcoholic can say, or if he has a certain number of drinks during a day, he feels that it's common. Others have so many drinks a day. I'm certainly not an alcoholic. I can remember hearing people say, well, I'm not an alcoholic because I don't drink before noon. And that's where someone becomes an alcoholic if they drink before noon. Uh, I don't know what various bases people have of where they draw the line of saying, uh, or if I fall off dead drunk, or if I just, or if I have to quit my work, then I'm an alcoholic, or I can't hold down a job, then I'm an alcoholic, whatever the various areas are. But the, whatever habit they have associated with that indulgence, it causes them to keep returning. They use kind of the clock as a reminder, or the passage of time as a reminder. In alcohol, if someone's used to having a drink with after their lunch or uh, one in the cocktails in the evening before they have their evening meal then and they miss that time then something says whoops we I missed that time I, I, I missed that drink and then if they miss the next time for that little fix if we may call it that then they begun they begin to be more aware of of the fact that they're behind in their dosage of what it is that they're interested in. In sexuality, as a drug, it's the same way. When people are vibrating at the level of participating in sexuality, they become quite aware of how long it's been since they've had their fix or since they have participated in that which was so much pleasure, and they know how it draws them, draws them to that any image that would encourage them to participate in that activity. In the same way that an alcoholic would be drawn to an open bottle and a glass of his favorite scotch or whatever it is that he liked to drink, the same way in our sexuality as we open a magazine and we see the picture there that would turn on the vehicle or the influences that are using the vehicle, then it's triggered and we we start having images in our heads and we start imagining participating in that activity. And so if you stop and think of all the aspects of sexuality and sensuality, how it draws us in, and in the same way that the alcohol world considers, or that the human world considers alcohol fairly accepted behavior, and certainly sexuality in most societies is considered an acceptable, acceptable behavior. As you go from one society to another, that one, because of its religious ma background, might feel more that it should be saved for marriages and for some religions, more for saving for when you want to have children. But generally, the longer the age exists and the more liberal the world becomes, the more it's considered to be just an indulgence and pleasure. Now it's even begun to expose itself as an indulgence and pleasure, so much so that I have a right to do what I want to with my body, and if I choose to get rid of the result of my indulgence and pleasure, and it turned out to be a pregnancy that I didn't want to get rid of, didn't want, then I certainly ought to have a right to do what I want to about the side effects of my indulgence. So it seems to be acceptable as an indulgence to whatever degree I want to indulge in it. Now, of course, with the problem of AIDS and, and uh, other uh, diseases that might be 
pass, then people begin to put up a little guard, but they get even so hooked on their booze of sex, if I might use that, that they, they even forget to use their protection, or they forget if they're so taken by the person that they're about to have that experience with, then they lose control and they realize, oops, I didn't, I didn't even protect myself. And in nearly every segment of society, we promote this degree. I, I mean, it's considered to be a healthy act. It's considered to be a normal act. When it comes to that in any given age and in any society, it's almost impossible to talk to them about a kind of picture that, as we talked in a previous session, that you have to move into on a basis of the kind of evidence that is revealed to you as a result of your faith. The evidence being this big picture. And then when, because of your faith of continuing to stay away from those drugs and you're overcoming, then you begin to see the big picture, it becomes more clear to you, and soon it makes so much sense to the, you that you say, great goodness, I can't imagine why I could do anything else. I mean, this is, I'm so glad this has been revealed to me, I feel so lucky in seeing it. And we are extremely lucky to have been given that. But the question that Starr asked, does detox fit into this? It does. You, you will only have a little glimpse and you will then deal with doubt. You, will ex you might expect to continue to deal with doubt and doubt and doubt and wondering if this is the right thing to do and the pangs of the world that you might be trying to break away from, they will want to draw you back in the same way that a drug would want to draw you back until you have separated more from them and not only a little distance but a little time gets between you and them and detox begun begins to take an effect and it begins to work with you. So that is certainly a valid question that can help us in overcoming. If we know that if we can stick to this and just stick to it and stick to it and put that behind us and it doesn't exist, I don't even identify with being alcoholic anymore. I don't even identify with those vibrations. They aren't there. They, as far as I'm concerned, they weren't there. It doesn't connect with me, then I, my head becomes clearer and clearer, and I become like an innocent child that can see a picture that is given to me, and, and I can see it for exactly what it is, and all of these demons don't come running in to try to destroy it for me, because they are under control. They had to begin, or had to become under control as I was led through my own detox program. Well, I said we were going to move on, and we're going to try to move quickly today. So, Destin, what's next on our list? Well, you probably covered this, but I was going to ask, what about uh, learning to exert the effort to change? I'm afraid we haven't covered it enough, and I'm glad you brought it up. You know, I can remember T saying so many times in our classroom, if you just would exert the effort, and that doesn't necessarily mean anything to you, if you don't understand the meaning, but it's change does not take place by examination. Uh, change does not take place by analysis. By running it through your head again and again, it only takes place by doing it. By actually, like if, you, if, if you're on a procedure where you, or you're at a lesson plan where you are to stop something, the quicker you can get past examining it on how you're going to do it, and you start doing it, then change begins to take place. But so many times, particularly in the human world, we talk about it, we examine it, and a lot of times that's all we really wanted to do was just examine it and talk about it and philosophize on it and write books on it. And oh, it was a neat idea, but no change took place. I'm the same person that I was before I wrote the book. Just had a lot of neat thoughts. When we're changing from the human kingdom into our Father's kingdom, we lose our identity a number of times along the way. We become a different individual, a different individual, and a different individual. And I'm certain that 
you know, it could have certain drawbacks. I'm sure that some of the class members, as they visited in their family, and they could say, well, you know, I don't know this person anymore. And they would wonder, where is that person that I used to know? And I'm afraid that they would be right, that they don't know that person anymore. Now, sometimes they'll try to pretend to be that person if that's what they're looking for, but even it becomes pretty obvious when you're pretending and you realize something's different here about this individual. And the more we change, the more difficult it becomes for us to identify with those who put us in the position of what they used to remember us to be. So the important point here, though, in this little question is I've got to stop talking about it. I've got to stop just examining it or analyzing it. I have to move forward. It takes work. Now, another label that we put on that frequently is just simple procrastination. I can't really get with it. And I, I plan to do it, and uh, we're going to do it tomorrow. ASAP is, the, is an instruction we have. As soon as we learn about it, then the first opportunity is when we do it. Whatever it is, any new instruction. When we hear of it, then what's stopping us? We have to be sure that, why wouldn't we do it right then? We have to be sure that something else would be a higher priority to prevent us from doing it right then. So it's very important that we learn to move with change, discard our old self, move into our new identity, make that adjustment, not try to bring that old one with us. There, there's a calamity there. It just simply doesn't work. Okay, what's next? Is that the completion of that one, Destin? On that particular one, Okay, yes. Star, let's, what's next on our... Um, do you want to touch on the um, principle of I could be wrong? Yes. Uh, what Star is talking about here is that in our classroom, we received instruction way back at the beginning that one of the best tools we could have in how to present our thinking and how to work with our partners and in a crew situation and with our teachers is that when we're making an observation or we're voicing an observation, we say, well, I, I could be wrong, but it seemed that so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Now, it doesn't work when we're just saying it. We did along the way, nearly all the students would say it for a while and they didn't mean it. And they had to learn that it doesn't work if you don't mean it. And so you could say, well, how are you going to mean it? How are you going to say, I could be wrong when you believe you're right? And so let's examine that for a second because it means that I need to stop trusting my judgment of the circumstance, or my observation, or my any kind of judgment that I might have had. And if I stop trusting it, stop believing it, then I am losing self-confidence. Yes, that's one of the things we lose in this transition, is self-confidence. We become like a child that says, I don't know anything. I don't have any self-confidence in anything. I have to look to the next level. I have to let the representative from the next level serve in that position of my looking. I have to say, you know what's right. And if I bring things to my older member's attention, I say, I think you asked for this, so I'll share with you what you asked me to on my observation of this or what I thought about this, but I could certainly be wrong. And it has to be sincere if we are genuinely going to move into the position of not having self confidence. Now, believe it or not, since the world out there is so artificial, and therefore our judgment as humans was artificial, that as we move into the transition of becoming babes in our Father's kingdom, by saying, I could be wrong, we begin to lose the confidence that we used to have in the artificial. And we have less and less, and soon we learn that we were wrong. And that comes kind of as a shock to us because we thought that we were right. And then we thought, well, if it's a good lesson to lose self-confidence and say, I could be wrong, then I'll try to do that sincerely. And, but it almost comes as a shock when you actually realize that again and again you're shown that what you thought was the case in your observation or your judgment that it wasn't right. So you then say, well, it's working. 
I am dropping the artificial. I, in other words, I'm not sold out any longer to the wrong side. I'm losing the programming. I'm, I'm being led through step by step, destroying the old programming and realizing that it is not true, that over here is the truth. And you are given the understanding of the truth and the ability to recognize it if you faithfully do the steps as it comes along. Now, of course, Satan's side could say, well, who's to say that as you move over here into the new computer and its program, that that isn't the artificial and the old is the real. We can't, we wouldn't try to convince you of one way or the other. We're not selling into that. It's, but what we have been given to move into, we wouldn't trade for what we had, for anything. That is, those who have stuck to it faithfully long enough to make that transition, to do enough detoxing, to lose enough self-confidence, to move into that position of looking at that picture and saying, that makes a lot of sense. And then they start working harder at completing breaking the, away from those habits that they used to have and moving into a new identity and moving into a new identity. I'm trying to move fast. I'll stop. It's so hard to stop. Destin, what's next on our list? Did we talk about a lazy mind or a weak thirst? Um, is that part of the control of the pump? I think we spoke of it, but I don't think we spoke enough of it. We, I know it would be valuable for us to speak of it again. In a sense, we re-spoke of it just a moment ago when we were talking about procrastination. That's a weak thirst. That's, in a sense, a kind of a weak pump when I put something off. Or if I am slow to move into, to lose an old identity and move a step ahead and move, then that's a weak pump. <clears throat> To be satisfied with a slow pace is deadly, really seriously deadly, because we can get very much behind. What if, what if the classroom that you're in, if a lot of the class members are moving very quickly and they're making these adjustments and they're discarding the old and they're seeing the new and they're moving into their new position and certain ones, without recognizing it, they thought they were moving quick, but they, their perception of what was quick was poor their judgment of it. They, they really never knew that they were slow until it was brought to their attention. And they had to then put in a new chip and say, we got to replace that old one that misjudged. That was slow. That was tardy. That was too pleased with slow movement. Lethargy is a very sinful item, if we can put it in that context. context. And it's difficult to get beyond it. It's difficult to be eager and quick, but when we change into the habit, there are certain habits in our Father's kingdom that pay off. I mean, we're not changing all habits for no habit. There are certain habits that pay off. And moving quickly with full energy, abiding by instructions so carefully, knowing procedures, liking procedures, liking to change as it is given to us, not wanting to be the old self. Those are new habits, and they move us. That becomes then a rich thirst, one that is very thirsty. Just can't wait until another day and more lessons and opportunities. And a lot of times when we are in that position, boy, did they start coming, and we think, wow, what did I ask for? This is pretty tough. But we get used to it and we recognize it and when it comes even then we say well i got what i was asking for i got this new lesson and it's right before me and though it might be tough it's just like something that if you ask a, an instructor in the lab in the chemistry for you want the next lesson you want the next lesson and he gives you one and you say well i didn't mean one this tough <laughs> and that happens to us all the time and but after we get it we're honored that they thought we could handle it. And so we have to prove that we can handle it. We can rise above it, and then we become a little bit different from what we were before. So, weak thirst is deadly. Keeping a strong pump and moving ahead is very, very important. New habit to establish 
as we move into our Father's kingdom. Does that complete that question? That, that does. Thank okay. You. Star, what's next on our... Well, can the next level withdraw mind if we abuse it or don't use it? Goodness, that's that's kind of takes a little twist our brain around in a little funny place. And I'm afraid the answer is yes. Now, you can think, well, that sounds kind of cruel. You know, we've talked about how our Father's kingdom does a lot of the work with us that, that we're unaware of what they're doing. I know that many times T has done things and those who are helping T that uh, recognize that they have done in direct association with us. And it's only after they're done I thought, gracious, nobody could have done that but T and those working with T because it certainly wasn't anything that we even thought of or even participated in, and it was done. And we could see that it was for our sakes that it was done. We didn't even ask, but it was done because they realized it. If we were going to move forward, that it needed to be done. Now, back to Star's question. We've talked about the soul that has a mind of our Father in it, and it has a mind of this world in it, and we're trying to chip off at that mind that we don't want it and get it out of there as quickly as possible and fill up that soul container or that pillowcase with the mind of our Father's kingdom. Now, if we're in a unit like this classroom where they want to give us information and they're trying to consider the unit, and yet as they give us information, maybe some members of that unit aren't really taking it to heart and are they slow or they're trying to pretend to do it and they because they like certain aspects of the classroom and it's it's comfortable in certain areas and they uh, so they're not really examining if they could be moving faster those are all symptoms of abusing that mind as it's given to you if it's if it's artificial if you're not really moving into that position we have seen some members of our classroom just all of a sudden just turn almost 90 degrees and it was like we didn't know them and they had to leave the classroom and it was and we felt so sorry that that had happened now we're not saying that that they couldn't recover that that's between them and I'm afraid that's between them and my older member because in that position I'm not out there to help them. We have also experienced members of our classroom who've been out outside the classroom for a while and have come in. Some that are on our crew today are in that position, that they're back in the classroom and they're moving quickly in the right direction and it thrills us so to see that out of their own desperate thirst and their acknowledgement that this was true, that they got help from our Father's kingdom outside of this relationship that helped them get back into the classroom and back on track in a laboratory experience of a unit going through this process of discipline change and getting to our Father's kingdom. But it is true. It is something we have to be concerned about, that a gift of information can be given to you. You can increase it in that space, but if you don't do anything about it and you insist on clinging to this other information within that container or that pillowcase and there isn't room for all of it our father can very easily just move in there and pull that right out and suddenly you've lost your respect for what it was because it isn't there it was removed from you and then you still have the choice of what to do about that moment choice is something you always have choice and that pump and you can then choose to say, well, it must have not been worth anything. You, you know, it's up to you. Or if it, if it just destroys you and you feel vacant and empty and you have to have it back, then you may have to prove to some representative from our Father's kingdom who's working with you outside the classroom that you are worthy of returning to a classroom situation and getting further instruction in it. So it can be withdrawn. I'm trying to move quickly, okay? Test it. What's next on our well, list? Well, with that in mind, uh, is there a limit to next level's uh, patience? Yes, and I'm, I should stop right there, but I'll <laughs> say a couple of words on that. There is a limit. Uh, now, I, I think that any 
person in our Father's kingdom who is assigned to a task would never exercise that limit to patience without checking with their older member. And, of course, their older member is going to check with their older member and so forth. Up the, now, all that can happen pretty quickly. It's uh, the time lapse in that computer isn't that big. And, but when they do question it and the instruction comes back, they can say, well, the best thing we can do for them is to be impatient. And so then you understand, oh, so it's instruction to treat it this way, and it's not really just impatience. So at times, we do get instruction to be impatient in order to help that individual be shocked or to realize, I've got to get out of this. I can't just expect to be babied. I can't, uh, I don't need to stay where I am. So, you know, I can imagine that sometimes as some of the classroom watches these tapes, they can, they can recognize that there's a certain amount of relationship that I might be having with the viewer on the other end of that camera that might be slightly different from my relationship with them at times. And I think we've even discussed that in a sense I almost feel like a twice removed or a grandfather speaking to a grandchild. And of course I'm speaking to you as someone who might be wondering if they are standing outside of that vehicle that they're using and that they want to take it over and pursue this. And since we are given the task of trying to give that to you, and since we're so eager for you to participate in it, for it to become yours, then we are influenced by that. Now, of course, when I'm dealing with one of these students in a particular area, I might come on a little stronger if I have instruction to do so, and I might be pretty direct and right to the point, because I am assuming that they're on solid ground. They have chosen this. They're doing what they want to do. And, but they've also learned to recover quickly and be appreciative when we take a direct method instead of, you know, say, well, we'll bring that up, you know, in a week or so when they get maybe past what they're dealing with. Now, we don't have a timetable that can handle that. We deal with things immediately. I don't know if we said it clearly in previous sessions, but at one time within the classroom, we... We even agreed that we would expose things that we are that we have permitted in our mind or some activity that we've done with we would make a vow to our partner and to the rest of our class that we would expose it that day that we would not go down in our bunk without having acknowledged it exposed it and having gotten past it because we recognized how things can compound so easily and i can become more and more separate if i let things mount and don't expose things so that's a part of our procedure. What's next on our list? Start. Well, could you give us some examples of tasks or activities in our Father's Kingdom? Uh, you mentioned uh, radio signals. Or? That's a good one. I'm glad we brought that up. Um, we don't have a lot of knowledge of the activities that go on in our Father's Kingdom. and. Uh, uh, we have little tiny glimpses of what might go on, and, but we don't know the particulars too well. And I think it's good that they, or, or I suspect that the reason that they don't let us know the particulars about that is we'd probably go around so pleased with it that we'd boast about it, and that wouldn't be appropriate. But some of the things that we suspect are their activities uh, like you could say, well, what's going to replace, you know, uh, being a clerk in the department store or working in the hospital? And that's a good one because our Father's Kingdom has a fairly close equivalent to the hospital or the the emergency ward or the the uh, uh, certain uh, things related to uh, uh, medicine and trying to save lives. One thing that we suspect where our activity of our Father's Kingdom dives in and has a lot of work to do, and that is when a soul is leaving a vehicle. In other words, the, the leaf is falling off of that particular family vine. And that soul then is, is lifted out of that vehicle for that period of time. And we feel that it is an action of our Father's Kingdom if that soul is, has any significant relationship to our Father's kingdom. In other words, depends upon what is in that soul, what degree 
of that soul is made up of goodness or mind from our Father's kingdom. Now, we don't know where they draw the line. We don't know. I mean, they may even participate in handling these souls and helping them get from one fallen leaf to the next potential new leaf or coming through the womb so that they take a new vehicle. We don't know where they draw that line, but we do feel very strongly that one of the activities of our Father's Kingdom is helping souls be released from uh, a vehicle and uh, take a possession of another one or move into another one. Now, we've got to mention here just for a moment that how would another one qualify? That other one has to qualify in order to have a match for all of the things that that soul was hooked on in its previous leaf. This new leaf has to have the potential for all of those things because what it hasn't overcome, it's going to have to overcome. So that soul doesn't get to go out of the body and be teen and free just because it got to die, so to speak. Of course, it didn't get to die. Just the vehicle withered and fell off the branch. So <clears throat> this is, we feel, is definitely an activity of our Father's kingdom. We feel that our Father's kingdom, uh, like Star mentioned, what about radio signals? Uh, you know, the British Broadcasting Company or the, what are the names of some of these other free, uh, uh, radio free Europe or, what's that? Voice of America. Voice of America. Yes, these signals that are sent out, kind of propaganda in a sense. Uh, that are sent out over the air and people who have their radios, uh, be it shortwave or, or what, they, uh, those signals are actually sent out. Now, our Father's kingdom and even Satan's kingdom, they have realistically, with our brains, they can send out radio signals on frequencies that humans do not have the capacity to even perceive. Now, some humans, we've read some books where some humans have actually been advanced in their laboratory experiments with computers and oscillators and have actually learned some frequencies where they felt like they could pick up transmissions from, that, from space aliens or from other camps. We feel that the, the way these radio signals work is quite different from this camp over here. Satan's camp, Lucifer's camp, their propaganda is going 24 hours a day, seven days a week on just about every channel on the band or every band on the dial. Our Father's kingdom is, you, it's hard to find the bands. It takes effort to find the bands. And when you find the band, it's silent. Why? Because it says, ask. <laughs> and you receive. On those other bands, you don't have to ask anything. It's all it's free. It's just right there. It's just knocking you down, and you turn to every channel, and you get a lot more than you ask for, and you hear just about the same thing on every channel. If you stay on that channel long enough, you'll hear the same information on all the channels. And you find our fathers, and you wonder, oh, could that, could that be from God, or could that be from whatever your terminology is that might identify your relationship to our Father's kingdom. And it waits for you to ask, and then it sends you a radio signal. And that's the way it is. And they kind of help to give you clues by it, because in the scripture they say, be still, and to know that I am God. In other words, it's be quiet. And that if there's some mind of God in you, it will kind of stir, and it will kind of coax you into saying, why don't you ask? Why don't you ask? And so then you, which is the chooser, can say, what about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? And then the answers begin to come. Not necessarily the answers to the questions that you asked. They are ultimately the answers, but they may not be the answers that you're expecting. But it's, very, it's a very good analogy to realize that I said something that could be questioned. You could say, well, that little inner voice says, what about asking? I almost want to erase that because it is not the way in our Father's kingdom to ever be the aggressor. It takes, it's because you possess, by your choices, you possess that amount of mind 
of our Father's kingdom that translated in your head, I wonder if I shouldn't ask. I wonder if this could be my Father speaking to me in this situation. This happened to me and I don't understand it. So maybe I should ask, is this some of your doing? So it's a the radio signals is not only a good analogy, it is realistic. They send those signals out. They have that connection with our brains, with the literal space that we occupy. They can speak to us in that way. And so what we try to do is learn how to use the radio. It takes a long time to get a good orientation on how to use that radio in the right ways because that radio still has all those dials. You don't want to hear all those signals on. And you have to learn how to flip past them fast enough that you don't hear any words from them and you're not affected by them and how to get to those silent ones and then have a relationship with our Father's kingdom in that way. But it works. So that's another illustration of activities of our Father's kingdom. And of course, one big activity of our Father's kingdom that we haven't talked about much is there is a strong possibility that what can happen at the end of an age is new to all the souls that all the humans that are, are alive uh, during that age and they would have no evidence of it we might have discussed this for a moment they would have no evidence of it because they have no books that say this has ever happened before in other words this, this is an activity where they come in from off away from the planet or even from out of bases and they have all kinds of things to do in harvesting at the end of the age then no one's expecting it because it's been wiped from their memory if they were in that age before where it happened then it's clearly wiped we don't know if they were or not but that is also a big activity as gardeners as gardeners helpers from our father's kingdom uh, all the little aspect whether it's saw samples or checking on souls as they move from here to there and they migrate from here to there as they're in the process of breaking away from their ties and watching them as even as they move from one country to another or one career to another they begin to realize this isn't what I thought I was looking for and the closer they get and the more they drop then the more attention they get from our father's kingdom as far as monitoring and and uh, helping answer their requests or their questions as it comes through the radio signal that gives us a little picture Let's move ahead. Who's next? Destiny? I think I was. Well, that certainly covers what can happen to a soul at the point of losing its vehicle, but I was wondering what are some of the conditions a soul um, can be in during its incarnations? Between. Between the incarnations. Oh, that's, that's a good question. Okay. Uh, it certainly isn't right to think that as a soul, as a vehicle is lost and as a soul leaves that vehicle, that then all those souls just go afloat out there and become discarnates. And uh, this is an area that we don't know much about and we're not supposed to know much about. This is an area that is completely controlled by our Father's kingdom, though some from the opposing forces are permitted to do certain tasks within it that they think are for their benefit. And in a sense, if they're garbage removers, it is for the benefit then even of our Father's kingdom, if you can follow that logic. But some souls might be taken out and put aside and left in the cellar, kind of in a or a refridge or an icebox in the freezer for, uh, in a dormant condition until an appropriate time comes. Let's say that some souls might have possibly, this is just to clarify the analogy, some souls might have possibly in a previous time in this age or maybe even the age before, we don't know all these details, that souls might have reached in their overcoming, they might have gotten a whole lot of things off their checklist and things that they had to overcome but there was just a few things and those things weren't going to come up again until a certain time and our father's kingdom knew when that time would be then wouldn't it make sense that those souls then would be taken out and left in a dormant state until that time and in other words they're kind of asleep and uh, Jesus kind of tried to illustrate that as he spoke of death of the vehicle as asleep 
Oh, I'm afraid I have to bring up something I'll try to get rid of quickly, but as we listened to yesterday's tapes and we talked about how Jesus, at the condition of experiencing what was considered to be death in payment for the debt of the sins of those that gave him their notes, even though that was not really death because certainly his soul didn't die. It was only the vehicle that was affected. It was their interpretation of what death was. Now, the application of the word death in the sense that sins, the wages of sin is death, or, or death, I don't know which is right, uh, in the way that that might be a vehicular death as against a soul death might be the proper application. Because the reason that humans continue to have to lose vehicles, the reasons they become continue to be perishable and corruptible is because of their sin. So I guess it works both ways of being both applicable to the vehicle as well as the soul. The soul is not going to be destroyed until our Father's kingdom says it has become nothing, it holds nothing good. There's nothing there except matter that can be recycled. And in that sense, then it isn't destroyed, it's just recycled. It's non-existent because it became non-existent. Now, as far as vehicles, losing vehicles, uh, or if, let me put, go the other way, if the soul then goes and comes bigger and goes into our Father's kingdom, then it can receive even a vehicle that is incorruptible and imperishable and therefore neither the vehicle neither the soul nor the vehicle would know death but the way the wages of sin is death or our death is illustrated as it was in Jesus's mission uh, in trying to help them understand our father's kingdom certainly it was used as the physical death being the illustration because that's what they thought death was and it might even be that physical death or death of the plant or losing the physical vehicle is the result also of their sin, not also that the soul can't be lost eventually as that mind deteriorates. I got off the track a moment, but I thought we wanted to touch on that for another second. Who's next on our list? Star? Star is it. Uh, how high a priority is liking to stick to procedures? About as high as they get. I mean, there's nothing that can happen to me or any student of our Father's Kingdom that can be more of an asset than for me to love to stick to procedures. If I resent procedures or they're in my way, then I will have chosen slow growth, I will have chosen tardiness, I will have chosen rebellion. and. Sometimes influences would have us resent so much of a design given to us. Uh, here I have to go back to the astronaut illustration because an astronaut could resent all of the procedures given on a spacecraft. If they say, well, now all the crew is going to do this at 2 o'clock and this at 2.20 and this at... And we use the bathroom this way and you have to do it exactly this way and only this paper and this... In other words, we don't have any choices. We usually own this, only this toothpaste and only this do we consume. Then they're crew members and they can be a cog in the wheel that doesn't have to be another color. Therefore, it can fill any place where a spoke might go in the wheel because they are so flexible because that's such the magic word for a crew member. If I don't love procedures, I am retaining inflexibility. I am reluctant to change. I am rebellious. So we have a zillion procedures. I mean, sometimes we get instruction to update them and we'll go and examine what's, what was the procedure we had for this. And, and maybe it has been updated. What we had before was a little outdated. So once in a while we do get instruction to update them. It's not that they're static. They change and they stay with us as they are appropriate. But every member of the classroom, I'll, I'll 
test you for a moment. I mean, like at a moment on the clock, at a given time, that's when their head hits the pillow. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's when they're down. And they try not to have it vary. Uh, I mean, they can't say, well, you know, I'll, I'll be with there in another five minutes. Or, I mean, that they plan their time so that go down time is go down time. That get up time is get up time. Now, that doesn't mean if they need to go relieve their bladder in the middle of the night that they can't do it or they have to wake somebody up in order to do it. But we have procedures that help us demonstrate our crudum or our crewness or our identity as a crew member instead of as individuals that want to do, want the little freedom of doing this a little differently. Now, it's true that one vehicle that might be a little smaller might consume a little less than another vehicle or depending upon how how the way terms we use is uh, high spenders uh, in, uh, vehicles are that are high spenders of energy or fuel might need to consume a little bit more fuel so they have to adjust their consuming some to adapt and sometimes we would say this item on the menu and this item would have so many cups of this or so many half cups of this except for weight gainers might have this or this and so we uh, that's the way we pr receive procedures. And you can say, good night, this is structured. Yes, it's structured. And I love it. <laughs> and I, it's not that I enjoy being the instrument of giving out these procedures, but these students love it. They've seen the value. It does not restrict them. It frees them. But you have to have been there to know what we're talking about. Otherwise, you can easily doubt it. It liberates them. You'll have to learn that if you come this way. What's next on our list? Destin? Well, is there a lesson in mimicking or copying our older member? Boy, we're hitting all the things that can run people away, aren't we? <laughs> oh, goodness. <clears throat> mimicking or copying our older member. Boy, does that put your older member on the spot? Um, Yes, there is. I can remember when T would see a class member copying someone else, and T would say, if you want to copy somebody, why don't you copy me? And a human could hear that, and she was saying that in reference to herself. Now, a human could hear that and say, good night, who does she think she is? And yet, she was saying it as an older member. She was saying, I'm your older member. I'm someone that hopefully has followed my older member enough that if I have those things in place in my behavior, then you would have only to gain by doing what I do. Not that she's bragging or saying, look at me, I'm such a perfect individual, and if you follow me, you'll be so perfect. It's, it's that I have been given a gift of learning from my father, which I will gladly share with you. And I know that what I have learned required also that I discarded all of my separate ways. And the more I discarded, the more I saw that, boy, I wish I'd discarded these a long time ago because the ways that I learned from my older member were so much better than the ways that I had, even in little bitty things. And you, you see the utility of them. You see the advantage of them. You see the usefulness of them. So... Yes, it gets right down to, it's better to, if you want to copy something, if you want to mimic something, then why not choose someone who is ahead of you in the process of discover, or discarding uh, selfish thoughts or rebellion or human behavior and try more to follow the lead of procedures and ways and even new habits from someone that's illustrating that position. Now, it puts the spotlights on your teachers. It puts them in a pretty exposed position, and they like exposed positions because we all like exposed positions. Listen, I learn new lessons every day. I expose new things every day. My older member shares with me correction every day. 
and I hope that the options for my growth are unlimited. If you think that anyone in our Father's kingdom has arrived, you are under a misconception. Certainly not from their point of view. Each one of the members of our Father's kingdom only relates to themselves as being the youngest member and they look at everything above them as where they're going. And therefore, they have everything ahead of them. They don't think, well, I've gotten, boy, look where I've gotten, I'm up here. They, they from their perspective, they, if they're serving some students or they're trying to help some students, and that's almost a side issue because still even that task of serving those students is a part of mimicking your older member, learning for your old, from your older member who has served in that capacity before and you haven't. Therefore, if you don't constantly ask your older member, you're going to get off track because they're the ones that have the experience, they're the ones that have received the instruction, and they're the ones assigned to giving you the instruction. I remember the crew just stepped up with a two-minute uh, sign for this session and I'm going to ignore it and we're going to proceed and just continue until we have covered these things on our list. Who's next? Is Star? I think Star was it. Um, what about someone who's too old or too young to start the process? Um, did I hear you uh, say that uh, souls don't uh, age like vehicles? Well, that's a double-barrel question, but uh, someone who's too old or too young, of course, in order to ask that question, she has to be talking about vehicles, not souls. And whether or not the question, we'll come right back to that, but whether or not souls age, souls age only in the sense that if a soul goes in one direction, it can eventually be, become nothing and therefore die. If it goes into a, another direction and goes into our Father's house, it gets into an ageless condition that as long as it sustains its position, it can get into our Father's kingdom and still be corruptible. It can still go the wrong way like Lucifer did. So the potential of choice exists even in our Father's kingdom, and it can lose its agelessness. It can then have to do all kinds of artificial things to try to maintain it, and it might lose vehicles and have to take other ones, just like they do in the human kingdom which isn't the case in our Father's kingdom. Now, what was the front part of that question again, Star? Well, it's, um, what about someone who's too old or too young to start okay. the process? Too old or too young as far as a vehicle is concerned. I believe that our Father's kingdom has, in all fairness, to any soul that is deserving of any information that has a timetable on it that our Father's kingdom sees that that soul is in a, an age vehicle or a vehicle that can receive that information. If that soul uh, is in, even hypothetically, if that soul is in a young vehicle that might be too young for this experience or uh, the individual might worry because they're about to lose their vehicle, and they have a lot of our Father's mind in them, and our Father's certainly not going to consider them waste, then they would be put aside until they have this opportunity to do it again. So in that, but if you take this information with the idea, oh, so I'll get this chance again, then that gets a bad mark on your readout, because that's not the way we proceed closer to our Father. We don't then make the choice of putting off what we could do in relationship to moving closer to our Father. But in, in order to help us understand that our Father is very fair, our Father's kingdom is very fair as they relate to souls, that they would never be so unfair as to have a deserving soul miss out just because of the age of the vehicle that it might be wearing, that it would either receive it at another time or let one of the other influences take over that vehicle it would, and it would then take over a vehicle that was the right age, now this might be a little hard to comprehend, but the possibility exists that a soul could be relating to a vehicle and our Father's kingdom, who only has the right to do this, even though Lucy tries to do it all the time, take over vehicles and shove them out where they don't, uh, where that vehicle doesn't belong to them. Our Father's kingdom, who does have the right to it, could actually take a soul out of a vehicle, let other souls take it over, it would continue to live, and the 
people who knew it would say, what happened to that, that child or that old person? Because that's not the same person any longer. And then that soul would then move into another vehicle that was still healthy mentally or of age enough that, and suddenly the ones who were identifying that vehicle would say, what in the world happened to that person? They're changed. What is all this preoccupation with this overcoming the world or uh, their religious being born again, whatever it is that happens, uh, has happened to them? So it can happen in a number of ways. There's nothing to fear as far as age of vehicle, whether it be too young or too old. Our Father's kingdom takes care of that. That's part of their activities. Dustin, what's next? Well, I was wondering, what about some of the prophecies, like the 144,000? Uh-oh. The raptures, <laughs> incarnations. Goodness alive, I can see why this might be the wrap-up meeting, because we're going to get into things that are really going to be able to throw arrows at us. If we say much about them, maybe we just shouldn't say it. <laughs> Oh, goodness. And the only thing that has been shared with us, and I don't know how accurate it is, but we'll share a little bit with you, is that um, as far as 144,000 is concerned, whether or not that's an accurate number uh, or means anything, uh, I certainly don't know. It may be. Uh, how that works, I wouldn't know if it was an accurate number. As far as who it represents, if it does, in fact, represent those overcomers, then I'm afraid that that number then applies either realistically or symbolically to you, you who are about to overcome, you who are about at this end of this age to move into our Father's kingdom. Now, as far as <clears throat> raptures are concerned, you know, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not a rapture is, even exists, and what is a rapture, and some say, well, that only happens after you've taken a spiritual body, but what is a spiritual body? If you have gone with the spirit or the mind of our Father's kingdom and you have been lifted out of the world, and some interpretation of rapture is lifted out. I don't know if this is true or not. It doesn't really matter. It isn't significant to us. It's no basis for our allegiance to our task. And it shouldn't be to you. And if you can think of it in that light and just simply be amused by it, because we're not trying to uh, lock in on what we're doing with fulfillment of the prophecies in the book of Revelation or Isaiah or anyplace else or Daniel. But to me, uh, just for fun in association, when we got the instruction to take the class out of the world, lifted them literally out of the world, went into isolation. Nobody could find them. They didn't exist as far as the world was concerned. And even if they took a job once in a while to bring in a few sticks to try to buy some hamburgers or whatever it was, they didn't relate to anybody in the world. They only went to that job, went right back to their isolation. And that remained that way for all these years. And if anybody has been lifted out or kept separate from the world for the time that they received their overcoming, if that word can symbolically apply to anyone, I certainly don't know why it wouldn't apply to our class. So if there's a first rapture in that sense, then I can't imagine that that hasn't been or isn't applicable to our class. Like I said, it doesn't mean anything to us. We don't count on it. It, it doesn't motivate us. And in the same sense, if there's such thing as a second rapture, which is more important to us now, the possibility of that, because that would be you. That would be you moving into your own monastery, you in your own overcoming your total separateness, your insistence upon not relating to the human world. Now, in the same way, a couple of other terms in prophecy that are referred to so much as first resurrection, second resurrection, they're just other terms for in our head of the same thing. Because if the soul has come into life, if the soul has moved into a vehicle and has taken over that vehicle and that soul itself is 
incorruptible and imperishable, whether it loses the vehicle or not, then it has resurrected. It has moved back into life a bit at a time. And that has happened certainly to the class that is ahead for those who might follow in their path if they receive this information. And even though this touches my heart to talk about this, and it touches my heart for your sake, it's like, again, I have to say that we're not going to go out and try to invite more arrows being shot at us and more daggers thrown our way on the basis of fulfillment of prophecy. We do not know the accuracy of this. We find it amusing. You know, one time T and I went into a place because we were so moved because we thought we were, we were going out to tell the truth about the kingdom of heaven and how to get from here to there. And, and if that wasn't two witnesses, we didn't know who two witnesses were. And we went into this place that was supposed to be a spiritual center. And lo and behold, as we were sitting there waiting for the leader of that spiritual center, the, the, the student was in the room with us and started asking us some questions and said, well, you know, what are you all about? Or what's your information? Or, you know, and we started sharing with a little, with that student a little bit. And we finally got to, she said, well, you know, uh, what is it you're saying? And we just out of our naivete, we said, well, we think that we might be fulfilling the task that is referred to as two witnesses in the, in, in the book of Revelation. And the student just hit the ceiling because her two teachers were the two witnesses. <laughs> so, goodness alive, did that do a number on our head? We thought, gracious, we don't want to do that again. And it, it's like... Uh, uh, whether we were or not, it, it was a good experience for us to experience that. And so from that point on, it didn't matter to us what the reality was. Who's going to prove what the reality was as far as who might be the fulfillment of the application of certain prophecies of individual? Okay, Star, what's next on our list? Well, why did Jesus say he was king of the Jews? And who are the true Israelites, the overcomers? Okay, um, King of the Jews, who are the Israelites? Well, I'll try to move quickly. If you really know the meaning of the old meaning in the Hebrew of Israelites, or who the Jews really were, the word meant overcomers. So to me... Those who overcome the world, those who move into this position, are the true Israelites, the true Jews in that sense. Jews were those representing the Israelites. Jesus was trying to relate to them. He was saying, we are the overcomers. We are the rightful heirs. And I've been sent, so I'm serving in the position as your king. Of course, by the, times the, by the time the humans heard that and went to the authorities and said, that guy's saying he's king of the Jews. And all those who considered themselves Jews and weren't students of his knowledge and didn't know anything, then they would certainly want to condemn him for such a thing as that. But the truth still exists today that the true meaning of the word is overcomers. And not that here again it means that much to us. We've saved some of these little questions that are kind of fun. To examine that don't mean that much to us for this last session and uh, but those overcomers are in a sense the true Israelites if they do succeed in overcoming you're not an Israelite if you haven't overcome it's just that is what you come into if you succeed at it okay Destin what's next did you want to touch on metaphysics the occult oh boy uh, metaphysics and the occult, uh, well, I have to say a couple of little things here. Metaphysics is like an attempt at interpreting what goes on in the transition from a human age condition to being out of the Earth's atmosphere, out of the human age. So it could have application both in our Father's kingdom, but even more so do we unfortunately believe that it is a counterfeit. It is a tool used to get 
off the track because you more common in the metaphysical approach to truth is the concept of ye are gods, we are hunting for that cosmic consciousness, we are hunting for that universal mind, and we're not really that concerned with overcoming the behavior that is not found in our Father's kingdom. So in that sense, it's, it's counterfeit, both metaphysical and the occult. Now there's one thing that I have to mention here, the people say about little movements that happen, they say, they're, they're the cult. Or, you know, the only real meaning of the word occult is hidden. That's all it really means. And so, uh, unfortunately, that if people try to derogatorily apply that to us, our information has been hidden, but now it is being exposed. So now that it is being exposed, it certainly isn't hidden. But the meaning has no meaning. A lot of people take terms that don't really have any meaning, and they don't know what the meaning of it is, and they try to apply them to things they don't like. That's satanic, even though they might be absolutely perfect servants of Satan. In every way, they're going to call others satanic, because they don't, out of their ignorance, they don't know any better. And in the same way, they would think of derogatory terms like cult, link it right with a cult, cult, a cult, same thing. And we've acknowledged if there ever was a cult or a culture that was different and unique and unlike the world and doesn't have a place in the world, then we take the prize, I guess, of being the cult of cult. And I'm afraid so did Jesus and his disciples. There's no denying that. So, okay, let's move on. What's next? Well, that's all I had for that session, but... Um did you want to talk about the possible big surprise at spade time at the end of the I think we've mentioned that. You know, uh, uh, Star, do you see something else on there? Well, it's just... Uh, I'm trying to push this forward. Right. It was just at the end of the age or the end of the age activity. Yes, I, I realized that when Destin started mentioning that. I think I'm not going to mention that anymore. What, okay. uh, what else is on there, Destin? What about the importance of mobility, short rentals? Okay, that's an important point mm -hmm. that we missed in talking to people as they try to prepare themselves a little bit. We left that out when we were talking about uh, the practical aspects of moving out of your world, indebtedness and uh, charge cards and that kind of thing. If you are starting to move in the direction of your own monastic situation, then, and as all of us do that, as anyone does that and tries to get, do the the applications right now and here in a realistic terminology to what's it going to take for me to get from here to there, then we have to move into a very mobile condition where we can pick up at any moment. We can follow instruction as it is given to us. We can't say, well, I can do that if you just give me two weeks or if you just give me four weeks. Or... Therefore, we'll get our belongings down to necessities and then whittle at them and whittle at them and then get down to necessities then whittle at them and whittle at them because our judgment of necessities now some might go to an extreme and walk out the door with what they have on their vehicle and then it becomes somebody else's responsibility to have them wearing something that isn't stinking to the high heaven so that doesn't work too well either we have to be practical and not just go to extremes but we do need to cut our excess down our possessions down so that we have real mobility if I don't, some forms of mobility or to have an RV or uh, something like that or to have, to be in an apartment or a, a house that has a very short term by the week or by the month, hopefully at the most, so that you wouldn't lose money uh, or lose much money if you left prior to the completion of that month. Certainly not a long-term lease and then just having to pick up and leave. In this world, it's hard to find anything, anybody, the, where they will rent something pleasant to you on a short term, and yet you have to work hard to find something that's short term, or you work hard trying to convince them to rent to you on a short term and that you will take care of it and it wouldn't be a waste of their money and effort. You might even do improvements on it for the short term that you're there in order to interest them in letting you stay there. It's too, lodging has become too expensive to, to, uh, rent place like in a hotel or motel on a, on a uh, for the most part, on uh, a temporary basis or a short-term basis. But realistically, we have to get down to these little nitty-gritty things. 
Okay, what, what else is on our list, Star? Well, is it right that the soul that was in a human can serve humans better from a kingdom level above them? This question came up because of, it seemed to help some of the students a lot. When I think on our last tape we were talking a little bit about how a dog who relates to a human uh, is moving out of his dog world and only wants to connect with the human world. Now, in the same respect, a dog can't learn much from other dogs. He can learn from humans if he's moving up, if that soul can move up in that respect. Wouldn't it also be true that if I'm moving into my father's kingdom, that I can't continue to live in the world? I have to move into my father's kingdom in the same way. I have to isolate, not participate in that world. I have to isolate only with members of my father's kingdom. That can help, because some can say, well, goodness, how can you justify not continuing with human, humanitarian acts and charitable acts and taking a responsible position in your community? The same parallel would exist, well, how can the dog not be a good dog and a good example for his dogs, for the other dogs in that community, and try to raise their standard? That's fine. That's exactly what he should do until the time that he is reaching for more. Then he leaves those dogs, he migrates to the human, and it starts on the process of trying to please only them. Same true in human relationship to our Father's kingdom. What's next on our list? Well, did you want to discuss something about race? Oh, well, it's funny that you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin asking a question like that. You know, uh, Dustin had to go through recognizing that he could, in a sense, be the only racist in our classroom at times when he was dealing with wondering if everybody else might be a racist. Can you see that if he has a consciousness of thinking that others could be prejudiced against him, then he is prejudiced about their, his imagination of their prejudice. He is the one then color consciousness, has color consciousness. And that influence would have him think that if people are coming down on me or if they're singling me out or if they're, everybody's bringing up things that I need to work on, then it could it have some bearing to the fact that my skin is a different color? And certainly influences would have him try to think in that way. And he recognized that here, as he would, as influences would like to have him recognize others as maybe being racist or maybe having prejudice, that he was the only one who, he had evidence of being racist in a sense because race consciousness is racist. It's so ridiculous for any minority group to want equal time, want no, want no inhibiting factors placed upon them, whether it be gays or women's rights or uh, other races, and yet they are the ones by their mere preaching that, that insist on that consciousness. If I am a black person that is insisting on black rights, then I am the racist. I am reminding you that I am black. I cannot overcome racism, no, nor can anybody who I am dealing with overcoming racism until I literally become colorblind. And the same thing in dealing with uh, differences of other types until I become blind to those other types. It, I, then I lose any prejudice if I sustain any consciousness of that kind of, of um, prejudice, then I become the instigator of prejudice. So it doesn't make a bit of sense. We have to become colorblind. Listen, in our father's hothouse, the plants have got all kinds of colors, and he likes them all. He, doesn't, he never said, this, I don't like that one. If he didn't like it, he would have done away with it. I mean, he likes all of those different plants and their possibilities and their potentials. What he doesn't like is if the soul within those plants want to go away and work against him. But he even permits them to do that. But nobody's as colorblind as our Father's kingdom, certainly. I'll, I'll turn that around and say instead of being colorblind, our Father sees the value in all of that, and, but sees it all as plants sees it all as his creation, sees it all as demonstration of it. 
But our consciousness certainly... Now, I'm, I'm afraid that it, when we move into our Father's kingdom, I, we don't know how many <laughs> colors there might be. The, probably the colors that there might be of our vehicles would be one that none of us has ever wore, worn, and they might also be alike. And therefore, we have to have colorblind consciousness. We don't want to have any favoritism or any negativity toward anything relating to how tall or how short or how fat or how skinny or certainly what color skin. That's beneath us. Okay, what's next, Star? Well, is it possible that the rumored um, approaching pl planetoid from, uh, is from our Heavenly Father's kingdom? Oh, I don't know if we ought to spend any time on that or not. There's been a little rumor that uh, there's a planetoid approaching this planet, and it's certainly the possibility that exists that it could be approaching reality of this spading time that we have talked about. And at that, I'm going to stop our questioning and move into our punchline, move into our finale, if we can, in humor, discuss it that way. I think probably the most difficult thing that I have to deal with, and that these students have to deal with, and that you have to deal with as someone potentially who's coming this way, is the acceptance of us in that relationship with you. In other words, the place that Satan has worked the hardest is to have you very reluctant to accept anyone as a representative of our Father's kingdom. And it, it, it's like uh, uh, the last thing you want to do is be a cult member. The last thing you want to do is to go off with some weirdo uh, and to fall in some trap or fall out of what is considered to be the norm. And we were in that same headspace before we started. Well, I have to give you an analogy. I saw a movie not long ago, and it's not a completely an accurate an analogy, but this, in this movie, this individual realized that they, an inheritance was coming up in this family, and this individual appeared on the scene as uh, someone that they thought was dead from before and said I and it had been so many years that passed had passed and the person reappears on the scene and says I am so and so and it would have put that person in condition to receive that inheritance now in that particular movie I believe that the person really wasn't an heir but it still had a good ending anyhow but let's say that person was an heir but there were and that person was the major heir in that particular inheritance and let's say that nobody else knew that. But the person who was the heir knew that, that they were the heir. What are they to do about it? If they say, uh, I have this inheritance to give to you. I have prepared this place for you. I have this whole world waiting for you. And I want to give it to you. Well, I know that's true in my case. You don't know it. I know it. How do I know it? Because I know my older member. Now, I don't want to get emotional here. I know my older member. I know that my older member is my older member. I worked hard against that. I didn't want to accept that. It was an infringement upon me. It was as difficult for me to accept my older member as my older member as it was for these students to go through accepting me also as an older member and as it will be for you should you accept them as older members and me as older, older member. But when I did persist, when I stayed with it until I could know my older member, And then I knew that this was my family. And that when it was time to go home, back to my family, and that it was a real home. And the inheritance was there. And it was for me. Now what's awkward here is that if we did not speak to you, 
we don't lose out. The inheritance is still there. You could never get these tapes. It didn't come with, that we're aware of, it didn't come with a tag on it that says we can't give it to you unless you involve someone else. But there's a problem that exists here is because part of what came with the knowledge of our family and its ways and its inheritance was also the knowledge that there might be other rightful heirs. There might be other sons. Now, would we come before you, would we put this information out if we were not interested in your possible relationship as an heir? What have we to gain by putting it out? for any other reasons. We have ridicule, blasphemy, scorn, everything. We have nothing to gain by putting this out. Part of the mind that is in us says, if you can be rightful heirs, how can we, if our family wants us to let the information out and to try to find out if there are rightful heirs, how can we refuse that? Can we say, no, I don't want to put myself in that position. I don't want to accept that jeopardy. Therefore, I must accept that I am an heir if I'm to offer the, any of that kingdom to other heirs. They must accept that. Now, if you're going to be an heir, you have to, unfortunately, be put in the position of accepting that relationship through someone who delivers the little message that says, here's, you know, it's like Publishers Clearinghouse as they issue out the who's going to be the $10 million winner, except this is a zillion times more valuable than that. We know that the truth we're saying to you is true. You don't know it. We can't expect you to know it. You, you're still looking at it. You're still examining it. You can know it. You can know it swiftly with our help, but you have to accept the helpers. Now, the, long, the faster that you can lick the rebellion and run away the doubt and take those steps, the sooner you move into your own sobriety, the sooner you see that picture, because that picture, in a sense, is our proof we know it. It's like we've been delivered a certificate that says, prove to us of our Father's house, of our place in it, of our inheritance. And that proof cannot come to you unless you take each step along the way, the way they have designed it. You have to take it from another heir who has come into that position. So we know the spot you're in. We know the spot we're in. And it's a tough spot for both of us. We know it is how hard it is for you to accept us. But we know that if you're going to be the beneficiary, you're going to have to accept us. We know we went through the same thing. We've dealt with it. Goodness, if I could take back the times that I doubted my older member, because from where I sit, I know, I know who my older member is. I know the truth that was given to me. My older member gave it to me. My older member with me. Look, my older member even sacrificed time in our father's kingdom to come and be on another test. Certainly didn't have to. And to take me through, to reach out and awaken me and to bring me into that knowledge and even said, well, look, we're partners. Let's think of ourselves as partners in this task. My older member didn't have to do that. It was for my sake that my older member did that. And then when, when it was time for my older member to move into position, always where it would be more lessons for me, for my sake to experience my older member dropping a vehicle, moving back into that kingdom and having to relate to my older member in a different manner. 
then it was for my sake and for the student's sake and for your sake. I know. I know nothing else. Nothing else means anything to me. And I don't want this to sound like a hard sell, but I know that it can be. It can sound that way. If you had actually received the certificate of your place in that inheritance, and it also said, if you would deliver this to possible other heirs, then they can also receive it. So we're in that position with you. And we hope that this whole series can be the beginning of your finding that place in our Father's kingdom that is so precious to you. It's not an easy road. It's the toughest road that can be found. We have no idea how the world would respond to any of us or what they would do with us. That can't be a factor here. We know that nothing can happen to our souls, and our souls is all that matters. Any inconvenience that we're put to or any, any interruption or interference or irritation, we can endure if it's part of go, what goes with the task. Not that our Father's kingdom would have it be part, but our Father has not yet done away with this other kingdom, and they have the option to act against us and to work as hard against us as they can. And we recognize that, and we're prepared for it. It would even be a difficult thing for you to do from your relationship with that world. They would look at you just, even though the, their main dagger would be pointed at this vehicle, and then at these vehicles, and then lastly at you, they would wonder what on earth has happened to you for you to be so crazy as to do such a thing. They may live to see the physical presence of our Father's kingdom and all this harvest happening and not know where they're going or what the sorting out is that's applicable or appropriate for them. We know where we're going. We know what's happening here at the end of the age for us and what may happen for you if you go this way. And we'll do the best that we can to follow, their, to follow our older members' lead in assisting you to travel as fast as you can. And we know that if, if you believe with all your might and you're on that route, that nothing can happen to you. We are concerned for you. If you want us to assist you, then that's an action that you must take. Thank you.